In this edition of Art Rocks, an artist finds inspiration from the most unlikely places. My studio was at 624 Royal Street. Living in a quarter then was interesting. Take an inside look at the puppets of War Horse. Within minutes, this sort of almost skeletal horse becomes extremely real. A non-fiction writer takes a new creative journey. It's fascinating to think that a sheet of paper is dead until it interacts with our mind. And we get a bird's eye view in these photos. A very familiar sight from a totally different vantage point. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello, I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine, and this is Art Rocks. In our first segment, we profile the career of an artist who started out in a little studio in the French Quarter. Today, Roland Golden looks back on over 50 years at the easel, following his passion. To everything there is a season, and this is the season of reflection for a painter and native of New Orleans. In his recently published memoir, Roland Golden, Life, Love, and Art in the French Quarter, you'll find an intimate look inside of the artist's family. After serving in the U.S. Navy during the Korean War, Golden was dating Stella Dusan, whose family lived across the street from his parents. With a bold career choice in mind, the aspiring artist had an important question to propose. When he asked me what I thought about that, him becoming an artist, I thought, I wanted to be with him no matter what he did, no matter what profession he chose, I want to be by his side. Roland and Stella were married in 1957 and moved into the French Quarter, where he established a studio at 624 Royal Street. With work and home within the unique community of the Vieux Carré, the couple reared three children. We loved the inner city. We loved walking to church. I was baptized at St. Louis Cathedral and just growing up in the quarter with all the characters. And we always had out of town guests. We were tour guides, and so I learned so much about the French Quarter and the history. It was magical. My studio was at 624 Royal Street, so it was in a very good location. And I was able to sell enough work to support my family, which was very important to me. Living in a quarter then was interesting. His subject matter included drawings of the French Quarter and jazz musicians that were popular with tourists. But a turning point came when Vincent Price, representing the Sears Traveling Art Program, made some major purchases. This financial security allowed Golden to branch out to other themes. I first met Roland in 1980. I was a reporter for the Times-Picayune, a staff writer for the Picayune. I just truly enjoyed his work. He paints the everyday world around you, the ordinary. It's the, the minutia of life that you see. In fact, what he does is he teaches you how to see the world around you. So I, I can never drive down a country highway now or drive through a city street without seeing a Roland Golden painting in front of me. I like old things because they have character. And I look for old buildings and things like that to put in my paintings. And so I borrowed my dad's car. I didn't have a car in those days. I just started doing things from South Louisiana that were, were rural, really, and took photographs. I work from photographs whenever I can. He's dedicated to going into the studio and working every day. He's worked in many different themes over the years. One of the first ones I saw was a whole series of paintings he did of New Orleans, downtown area, demolition. It, it kind of raised some eyebrows among chamber members that uh, you know, he was concentrating on the old rather than, than celebrating the new. In the 1960s and early 70s, the Vietnam War struck a chord in Golden's work. Always fascinated with history and the Civil War, he developed figural paintings with a poignant message. Unlike any other Civil War statue or monument to Confederate soldiers or Union soldiers or battle scenes that you've ever seen, but there were statues across battlefields with blood dripping from the arms or from the bayonets to make it really real to today's audience that war is really about people and blood. And this came through very strongly in that series. 
As Rowland's work reached a wider audience, the Goldens began traveling regularly to New York and the East Coast, summering at Cape Cod, and making trips to Paris and the south of France. In each locale, Rowland brought a passion for his work, expressed in landscapes and abstract interpretations that incorporated elements of surrealism. The Goldens moved from New Orleans to Folsom, Louisiana, north of Lake Pontchartrain. It was here that they rode out Hurricane Katrina. The devastation of his beloved city became the focus of a powerfully emotional series of paintings. Golden photographed endless blocks of destruction in New Orleans, beginning with neighborhoods he knew as a teenager. He's actually going down into the ruins of the city in the Lower Ninth War and the Upper Ninth War in Treme and, and capturing the destruction, that loss, and that terror. Uh, he, probably his most dramatic and passionate uh, uh, series of work that I think he's ever done. He also did drawings from uh, television news coverage of the early days when he couldn't have been here. And in fact, his son in Seattle recorded some of those newsreel footage and sent it to him so he could use them as uh, research materials to develop his compositions. He called it a controlled depression. He couldn't let it overtake him, yet he, he had to be in that depressed state to try to feel what these, the people went through. Katrina, Days of Terror, Months of Anguish, was a critically acclaimed exhibit at the New Orleans Museum of Art. I think those paintings serve for him as a way of working his own personal trauma out of his inner self and onto the canvas. Throughout his career, Roland and Stella have worked as a team. Roland is not the artist, as people think of, that has a, a new model hanging around that he hires. He's always here to just work for me or his imagination. He's always disciplined himself to draw and to try to further your ability, your technique and such like that. He has pretty much of a normal type of life. It's not this erratic type of, you know, artist. Uh, and we, you know, we've known some who are very creative. But you don't have to be like that in order to be highly creative. An artist really doesn't have time to create the work and then promote it and publicize it himself. He needs someone. Often it's a gallery who'll do that, or it is often the spouse, whether it's a husband or a wife, who take on that role, and Stella is a master at it. So uh, that's sort of Roland's secret weapon. She's a brilliant promoter. In fact, she's taught classes on how to promote artist work. So she has been a tremendous uh, asset to his career as a painter. And they're wonderful together. <laughs> she takes care of all the business and I do the painting. Yeah, she's great, she's, she's terrific. She's devoted to me and, um, and I've been very fortunate that I married her all those years ago. To see more, visit rollandgolden.com. Now, let's take a look at some of the upcoming arts events happening across Louisiana. For more information on these events, visit our website at lpb.org slash artrocks. And to find more arts activities, check out countryroadsmag.com. Next, we step on stage and meet the talented puppeteers behind the production of War Horse. So how do they breathe life into the star of the show, the War Horse puppet itself? Let's find out. We inspire so many people. We tear up, we're all saps for theater, and that's why we're here, and we love it. it. The magic works for us every single time, as it does for our patrons. Proctors is a, a
complex of theaters. And we encompass, we have the main stage at Proctor's, and we have the GE Theater at Proctor's, where we are right now, which was built during our reconstruction, and it has 400 seats, and it's a nice complement to our much larger main stage. War Horse was a wonderful surprise for us because it wasn't uh, top of mind in the Broadway community with your average Broadway crowd. It wasn't singing and dancing and beautiful girls and handsome guys. And the message of War Horse, it just, it's unstoppable. It's been a terrific sales success and we're very proud of the community to embrace a show that's not just at your average Broadway show. In uh, 2004, uh, an associate director came to the National Theatre of Great Britain and he knew immediately coming in that he wanted to work with this puppet company, the Handspring Puppet Company, based in South Africa. The inspiration for this horse actually came from a show that Handspring Puppet Company did before, uh, in the early 2000s, called uh, Tall Horse, which was a show about a giraffe. And the National Theatre of London uh, had been visiting Handspring Puppet Company, saw that show. There was some kind of <laughs> talk about it and then and then Handspring was approached and said this is perfect we can you know so they uh, they started on prototypes for making these horses it took them a really long time to figure out how to make a lot of the mechanisms work um, most importantly how to make a puppet bear weight and be able to move on stage and they had lots of different ideas that they tossed out before they landed on this from that you know one thing led to another and they decided to create this piece of theater they mounted the first production in 2007 at the National Theater and then it moved eventually to the West End. There have since been productions all over the world. The show starts and you see these three puppeteers with, with this horse on stage. And within minutes, you don't see them anymore and you just see a horse. The three of them really work together to make you just see an animal on stage for the duration of the show. I'm uh, the hind puppeteer. We work on Joey and Top Thorns. I'm the hard puppeteer. I'm the head puppeteer. And the three of us work together to create the character of Joey, uh, both his emotional life, his physical life, everything that you see is the three of us. Uh. When you look at the horse, I mean, it's not intended to look like a living horse. There's no horse skin on it. It's not supposed to be, oh wow, that looks, you can't even see the puppeteers. But because of the natural materials and because of the suspension of disbelief, which you know we hope to make easy for you, you completely forget about that. And within minutes, this sort of almost skeletal horse becomes extremely real. When I first started out in terms of working on the puppet technically, my entire focus and my awareness was all about how do I make these legs move like a horse's front legs move. And so then I'm and I and I I was basically just entirely focused on that, and as, and as my awareness began, began to get you know, larger and larger, the scope of my awareness so that I was less worried about how the legs are, and more worried now about what I'm being asked from my teammates and what I'm being offered from my teammates. And then as that becomes second nature, then all of a sudden you're able to react together while doing what you need to do, while listening to what you're, what you're getting from either your heart or, your, or whatever you're getting from, and then also taking your impulses off of whoever's talking to this horse, or how stimulating this horse. Suddenly, you just know what your teammates want, mm -hmm. without them saying anything to you. I mean, we don't talk to each other in the show, but you know, Patrick can lean forward and push me just the slightest amount, and that's enough to know how he wants to move forward, and that's, that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. the, the biggest compliment is when people say that we disappeared, and, and I do really take that to heart. When, you know, when Joey comes out for his big bow at the end and, and we get a huge cheer, I mean, we, we know that's for us and, and we're really proud to be a, a, a part of that. And the other thing I think that um, I'm really proud of is that this is a show that I think really stands for why live theater is still relevant. It's, it's an experience you can't have anywhere else. I would love for an audience to take away a, a very personal experience where they formed a relationship with a character who went on a journey that saw a conflict in a way in which they've never seen it portrayed before. We deeply believe in this art form and especially mixing, of course, Joey with it and the message with animals and horses and there's so many horse people in the region. So this is just a perfect coming together and we hope that as many people as possible can come out and share it with us.
In this next segment, we're sitting down with non-fiction writer William Donati, whose books have focused on the real-life stories of Errol Flynn, Ida Lupino, and Lucky Luciano, to name a few. Now, for the first time in his literary career, Donati is turning his attention to the past with an eye towards the world of fiction. Let's find out more. My name is William Donati. I'm a writer and professor of English literature. I'm originally from Memphis, Tennessee. I have four university degrees in literature. Byron's one of my all-time favorite authors. He was a wonderful satirist, wonderful romantic writer. Lord Byron was a controversial poet, and for me, the biographical aspects of his life were just as fascinating as the literary aspects of his life. So this is really how I got into writing biography through controversy. All of my books have to do with controversies. One of my titles is uh, My Days with Errol Flynn. I was a co-author on that. I analyzed the controversy surrounding Flynn. Was Flynn a German spy? So this is the Flynn book. This is what started it. This was taken by Peter Stackpole, who's one of the first entertainment life magazine photographers in Hollywood. My biography of Ida Lupino has been in print since 1996, which is quite an honor for me. So this is Lupino directing here. This is her with Errol Flynn, one of her close friends. I hope that is the definitive book. She was a wonderful actress, director, very eccentric though. This is Ida with Howard Hughes. Now, the life and death of Thelma Todd. What really happened to Thelma Todd? This is uh, UNLV Magazine, Mystery Solved by Diane Russell. Was her death in December 1935 murder, an accident, or suicide? And Lucky Luciano, the rise and fall of a mob boss. Was he framed by Thomas E. Dewey as he claimed? What happened to Luciana? So what was the real story? This is like reading a pulp fiction novel, except every word is factual. When it comes to nonfiction, evidence, documents, and sources are superior. A biographer is a long distance runner of writing. You have to be able to go the distance. You have to be able to ferret out every nook and cranny. The integrity of the author is what counts. The information is what counts. I can't invent dialogue. I can't write about a figure unless I have a document to base it on or a subject who cer certainly knew the figure and can give me the information. So when I wrote my biography of Thelma Todd, I went to every newspaper archive I could find in Los Angeles. I went to Boston, I went to Lawrence, Massachusetts. I dug deep, deep, deep. Writing nonfiction is quite demanding. You have to have facts. You can't invent dialogue. So switching to fiction is somewhat different. I'm writing a historical novel. My book has to do with the rise of totalitarian movements in Europe pre-1939. Why did someone have a tendency to be a Nazi? a fascist, a communist. It looked as if democracy was totally disappearing from the European scene. Many people were drawn to these movements. I want to get into that character's idea, his life. Why would they support this kind of movement? I want to recreate the period. My goal is to make the reader feel as if he or she is right there with the main characters. It's quite different to take a blank sheet of paper and just invent something. Dialogue is incredible. To be able to write dialogue, to be able to have a sentence that reveals the inner character of a person, wow, I can't do that in nonfiction. You can get caught in the novel and never get out. You know, you gotta be careful. At some point, you just have to close it and move on. I have a profound respect for authors. It's a very lonely life, trying to make that blank sheet of paper come to life. Whether you're writing nonfiction, or whether you're writing fiction. You walk in a bookstore and behind every book there's a story. You don't see the blood, sweat, and tears that the author poured into that book. It's fascinating to think that a sheet of paper is dead until it interacts with our mind. You can walk in a library and a book can be sitting there for years with dust on it, but as soon as you read it, magically it comes to life. So if I pick up a book that was published in 1935, and it captures this period, and I'm the only one looking at it. That's fascinating. It makes it come alive. 
In his book about Ida Lupino, Donati writes that Lupino was the most intriguing woman he ever met. Now it's time to explore another of Louisiana's treasures. Each week on Art Rocks, we celebrate and examine an artistic or cultural element with unique ties to Louisiana. This week, we take a closer look at the iconic statue of Andrew Jackson. This amazing representation of Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans was the first bronze statue cast in the United States. It was created by a self-taught sculptor who had never even seen an equestrian statue. Situated in Jackson Square with the St. Louis Cathedral as its backdrop, it's become an iconic image for the city of New Orleans. But the original statue was first commissioned for display in Washington, D.C as the nation mourned the death of Jackson. The seventh president of the Union, Jackson achieved the status of national hero in 1814 at the Battle of New Orleans, later serving two terms in the White House. Sculptor Clark Mills designed the tribute to Jackson, gaining fame for creating the first equestrian statue in the world to be balanced solely on the horse's hind legs. The finished statue, weighing 15 tons, was dedicated in 1853 at Lafayette Park in Washington, D.C. on the 38th anniversary of the Battle of New Orleans. Three years later, in 1856, Mills completed another casting of the statue for New Orleans. It was placed in the Place d'Armes Military Park, which was renamed Jackson Square. Two other full-sized copies of the statue exist, one in Nashville, Tennessee, near Jackson's plantation, the Hermitage, in 1880. And more recently, in 1987, in the Jackson namesake city of Jacksonville, Florida. In the language of symbolism, equestrian statues with one of the horse's legs raised can mean that the rider was wounded in battle. Both legs raised means the rider was killed in battle. Obviously, not all artists adhere to the symbolism, since Jackson avoided both of these fates. One could point out, though, that Jackson went on to greater glory as a United States president. And finally to Houston, Texas, where an architectural photographer is ascending to new heights, literally. Employing drone technology, this visionary is capturing a view of the city that's rarely seen. Have a look. My process is very simple and I try to be sort of as stealthy as possible and sort of quick as possible, um, you know, remaining safe. I don't like rush it, but uh, I like to sort of remain sort of unseen and not have people bother me and talk to me about it just because uh, it's sort of a controversial subject. When you're on the ground, I don't think you really think about your surroundings a lot, especially in, in downtown Houston when a lot of people are still sort of unfamiliar with it. Uh, I think they have sort of blinders on when they're walking around in the street, so it sort of gives us a di just a different context. Houston Crossings is a project that I started a few months ago that is shooting intersections from above in a sort of grid-like way that they all sort of align and it creates this uh, sort of abstract view of the city. When I first got the drone, I just had this, this image of, of flying up from an intersection and seeing sort of the, the city grow out of that image. And, and uh, as I started trying to do that, I realized how much I, how, how much I like to see, um, especially with this wide angle lens, the building sort of splay out from an intersection and, and you see it a very familiar sight from a totally different vantage point. Texas and Crawford specifically, you see uh, this construction project that's happening across the street that has these, uh, these columns poured, these concrete columns and nothing else, so that you get this interesting sort of splaying of that grid. Uh, you get the, a glimpse of the stadium, but you don't really see much of the stadium. And it just gives a different, uh, sheds a different light on the life of the city, I think. I studied architecture here at U of H, and I have been practicing architecture for seven or eight years now. But I started doing architectural photography here about two or three years ago, um, and I really just developed a love for that, and documenting other people's spaces, essentially finished spaces, and seeing what other people are doing around the city. 
think the great thing about drones is you're able to fly lower and into tighter spaces uh, than you normally would be able to. Um, the other thing that I think is really great is you have complete control over your exact positioning and you can you can be very deliberate about you know symmetries and axes and which is something that I do in the Houston crossings things I'm very specific about making it very symmetrical and so they all align really well the drone is a pretty simple technology really this is a quadcopter and you know as they get bigger they have more rotors uh, which spin in, in different directions to, to sort of control the direction or, or elevation the camera mechanism is called a gimbal which is uh, which is to stabilize uh, footage. All of the camera settings and everything are controlled from a, a mobile app, either on your phone or on a tablet or something. It's connected GPS satellite, so when, you, when I take my hands off the controller, it'll hover there so I can really focus on the shot. Most of my subject matter has been downtown. You know, uh, Houston Crossing sort of stemmed out of that. There was a lot of the sort of extension of my cityscape photography. You can sort of uh, center on a building and it sort of showcases where that building sits within the city in a really unique light. Well, you know, artistically, I, I think it really offers vantage points that you just couldn't get before. It's, it's enabling filmmakers to get shots that are low-flying, smooth, panning shots, and you know, these, these really amazing artistic shots that wouldn't be able to, to have been done before period. Uh, but when they would have been able to be, have been done, it would have been with uh, helicopters. So I think it's really allowing people like me that wouldn't be able to do this uh, the opportunity to, to, to see things from a, a light that they might not have been able to before. For more, visit petermalik.com. And that's it for this edition of Art Rocks. Be sure to drop in online at lpb.org slash artrocks, where you can catch up on any episodes you've missed and find information on upcoming arts events. Until next time, I'm James Fox Smith, and thanks for watching.